So today is kind of sunny, but it has been rather rainy. And uh, just raise your hand if that has impacted your plans in one way or another. Okay, good. All of you. There are a lot of you. Some of you like the rain and you don't make, you just are happy to have rain falling down. Amen. Yeah, we'll take the rain. We'll take the rain. I don't, I don't complain about the rain, but I will complain about what the rain does. So it was when the first big rain was happening and my yard is completely saturated and I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but my leach field was also saturated and so my septic tank can't leach out anymore. So as the water fills up my septic tank and I haven't had it pumped in a few years, I won't tell you how many. Yes, yes. And when I bought the house, so nine years ago, would have been how long? And initially, it dug it up and, and got it pumped and then covered up the lids, which at that point, I should have marked where the lids were. But where they were was um, underneath my trailer. So I had, I had parked my trailer on my property, and the lids for the septic tank are underneath. Now, my trailer's not like sitting on them, but I have to go move my trailer so I can dig up my septic lids so that the septic company can come and pump my septic tank. This is This is fun. This is everything you want to do when it's pouring rain on your day off. And I have all these problems. They're all like coming to this point. And so I go and I have, to, I have to jack up my trailer, get my truck out there. I have to put four-wheel drive on. I'm in my own property, in my own yard, just flat, but it's just muck. And I'm soaking rain. I'm just soaking wet and I'm grumbling because I have to move my trailer and then I have to dig up these septic lids and I don't know where they are. I know a general idea. And... So I back my truck up, and I go to jack my trailer up, and as soon as I move the hitch, as soon as I crank the hitch, it pushes the jack stand into the earth, because I also have gophers. I don't know if anybody here has gophers, but they have like their kingdom underneath my trailer. And I lift, I push, it's just one crank, I'm not kidding, one crank, this whole, the whole front end just dives down into the earth. And I have the wheels chalked, but the trailer just comes up over the chalks. It's coming down towards me and toward my, towards my truck. And so I just kind of jump back as it slams in and sinks the, the, the balancing footers, like on the corners. Those, the two front, they save, they like save my truck and everything, but they just sink down about a foot into the earth. And the trailer is now like this, my, the trailer jack is about this far from the ground. And I'm just looking at this. I'm like, I have so many problems today <laughs> to figure out how to fix. When we turn to this, this first section in Matthew, it's easy to read through the story of Matthew. We've come through the genealogy. It's laid out the story. But as we, end the, as we come to the end of the first chapter in Matthew, there's all kinds of problems. There are a lot of different problems happening. We looked at one, um, and yeah, you can turn in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 1. I'll give you a second to get there. But at the start of Matthew's gospel, I'm just going to kind of remind us the scene of where we find ourselves in the story of Jesus. We've had Matthew give his genealogy of Joseph. He says, this is the genealogy of Matthew, the, or of Jesus, the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. And then he traces this genealogy all the way to Joseph. But through that genealogy, you see this name repeated, Jeconiah. And it's to remind us there's this curse of Jeconiah's descendants, that everyone who is a descendant of, that no one who is a descendant of Jeconiah can sit on the throne of David. That's a problem. It traces it to Joseph. Matthew does this. Why would Matthew trace a curse to Joseph? Then he makes a point to say that Joseph is not the father of Jesus, but the husband of Mary, which is a break from the entire genealogy. Okay, that's a problem, that Joseph is the son of Jeconiah. And then you have Mary... We know now that Mary is pregnant. She's been visited. And it's been revealed to her by the angel Gabriel that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her and come upon her. And she would have this miraculous conception. She's betrothed to Joseph. And this is a legally binding contract they have together. It's not like engagement for us. We looked at betrothal. They're committed to one another. And at the end of this commitment period, Joseph will take her to be his wife. That's the plan. But now she's pregnant. And Joseph doesn't know, but she knows. And she knows that's going to come with its own huge set of problems. 
And so we have all these problems coming to a head at this last section in Matthew. So let's turn there and we'll read it and we'll see what God does to solve these problems. The way that these problems are resolved. We'll pick up in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. We're going to do two things this morning. We're going to kind of break down these verses. We're going to break down the passage, and then we're going to nerd out a little bit with some kind of nerdy stuff. So sit, sit with us, hang in there. And, uh, but before we do that, as we study God's word, I want to just open with a quick word of prayer. I recognize the Holy Spirit inside us that will enable us to understand his scriptures. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, you have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside us. And you, by your Holy Spirit, live inside us. And it's through the power of your Holy Spirit and the miracle of your Holy Spirit that we have life, not just life eternally, but life now and a life that can be transformed by the power of your word. So this morning, may you transform our lives as we study your word. That is a work that only you can do and to you be the glory for it now and forever. Amen. So what do we see? We see the first, the first verse there in 18. Joseph, Joseph's discovery. Mary is pregnant. We don't know exactly. The, the Gospels don't tell us how that conversation went down. It's possible Mary's come back from Elizabeth and she's been out there for a number of months and now she's showing. But somehow or other, Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant. And Matthew lets us know that it's by the Holy Spirit. But Joseph... Whether or not Mary tries to convince him of this or not, Joseph is not convinced. She's pregnant, and it's not his baby. That Matthew makes a point in this section three times to reiterate the point of Mary being a virgin. They haven't come together yet, which was just another term for coming together intimately and sexually as a married couple. That's in there twice. And then Isaiah's prophecy that a virgin shall conceive. So it's a point that Mary is a virgin, and yet she's pregnant. This this isn't possible, right? This isn't possible. And so when Joseph finds out that Mary, who he is betrothed to, he's committed to this woman to fulfill this period and take her as his wife, he finds out that she's pregnant. This is devastating news. This is, as we're going to see his heart, he's a righteous man, he's a good man, he's a merciful man, and the woman who he's committed himself to for the rest of his life has been unfaithful to him. That's a devastating piece of news. And it leaves Joseph in this situation where now he has to make a decision. This is a strong group culture, so everybody now knows that Mary is pregnant, including Joseph. So what's he going to do? He's left with this terrible decision he has to make. And the decision he makes is to divorce her. He makes a decision to divorce her. Verse 19. This would have been his legal right. She's clearly not been faithful to him. She slept with some other man, and she's pregnant with that other person's child. This is, this is clear to Joseph's mind. And this legally, his legal responsibility now is to divorce her. But if you think for a second, uh, this passage gives us two pictures of Joseph. It says, Joseph being a just man, he's going to do what's right, a righteous man, but also unwilling to put Mary to shame. And we think, think of that for a second, right? So Mary is pregnant and everybody knows it. 
Who do people think the father is? Who? Oh, Joseph. He's her fiance in our terms. They're betrothed to be married. It, it wasn't completely uncommon for married couples to lose self-control and to come together sexually. It wasn't an uncommon thing. And so they assume this baby's Joseph, Joseph's baby. And so what are they going to think if Joseph files for divorce? And there's, there's, a, there's a public procedure for this. He would bring Mary, an adulteress, into court publicly to clear his own name, right? He didn't do anything wrong. He's a righteous man. He's a just man. And in that sense, it would be easy to bring her before publicly, bring the community together and say, hey, I'm a pure man. You can ask her. This isn't my kid. She was the adulteress, and I filed for divorce publicly. But he doesn't want to do that. And here we see in, jo in Joseph, we don't see a lot of pictures of Joseph through the Gospels. But Matthew makes a point to show us this. This is who eventually Mary's husband and who Jesus' adopted father will be. Is he's this just man. He's going to do what's right, but he wants to do it mercifully. And as minimal impact as possible. And, and so he, he resolves in his heart, okay, I'm just going to do this quietly. Now he has to bring, he has to bring legal authority, Jewish rabbi in. To sign the divorce, you can't just do it without authority. And eventually it's going to get out that Mary's pregnant and Joseph's divorced and people are going to ask their questions and he's probably going to take a black eye because he'll be the dad that abandoned the woman because who's going to believe she's a virgin? Nobody. But he's willing to take that personal expense to protect Mary's reputation as much as he can. And so he resolves to divorce her quietly. So he comes to this difficult decision. And then he decides, he, he, whatever happens, he's going to sleep on it. He's going to go to sleep. And then he's going to start this process. And while he's asleep, an angel comes to him. An angel comes to him. This is Joseph's dream. He's asleep in a dream. And he's visited by an angel. And this angel has quite a message for Joseph. And this is going to be a theme, actually, of these opening chapters of Matthew, of an angel coming to people in their dreams, or messages or messengers coming to people in their dreams. We're going to see this a number of times through the first two chapters of Matthew. This seems to be, particularly with Joseph, how God wants to communicate directly with him through an angel in his dreams. But look with me at what he says in verse 20. As he considers Joseph... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. I want you to make a mental note of the son of David there. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save their people from their sins. Here we have a problem, because Matthew has made a point to trace the lineage of Joseph back to David to show that Joseph is an heir of the throne of David, except for he's got this curse of Jeconiah. So he, he is a descendant, but he is a direct descendant of David. He is in the house of David, of Judah, of David. But he has this curse of Jeconiah. And here the angel an, 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 recognizes him as Joseph, the son of David. And it's going to be important as we kind of wrap around towards the end. And then he gives, Jesus, uh, he gives Joseph two distinct instructions. One, don't be afraid. Take Mary as your wife. The baby that's inside her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to take her as your wife. And don't be afraid to take this baby as your own. You're marrying the woman that comes with a baby. Fulfill your responsibility. Fulfill your commitment. Don't be afraid to do that. And then... I want you to name this baby Jesus. Jesus, which actually is a play on word on the Hebrew term to save. It says, for he will save their people from their sins. He will rescue his people from their sins. This is the message that the angel brings to Jesus. Just The angel makes a point to say that this baby is by the Holy Spirit. Now in scripture, there are a number of things in the secular world that people use to bring and level against the claims of Christianity. And one of the easiest things, seems like low-hanging fruit for those who would attack Christianity, is this virgin birth, right? 
like you would believe in a virgin birth that the Holy Spirit would just make a baby inside someone. But as I was studying this out, it was reminded to me that the original picture of original creation. Who was it that was surrounding the surface of the deep? Who was it? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God was actively involved in the creation of all things out of nothing. And so for the Holy Spirit of God to create a baby, there's no challenge there. He created all things. And so the angel is just revealing to Joseph, this is the situation. Your wife is pregnant, but she hasn't been unfaithful to you. She is still a virgin. She is with child by the Holy Spirit. And that child is Jesus who will save his people from their sins. Then there's a break in the quote. And Matthew inserts a little commentary. This is what he says. This is the prophecy fulfilled. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, this is Matthew being inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we've heard this prophecy a number of times. But as we look at how Matthew is using it, there's going to be some challenges for us this morning. And some of this is going to be, uh, it might be a little tough sledding, so hang in there with us. And, and Paul and I will be up here after service if you have questions in regarding some of this stuff. But typically, when we hear the term prophecy fulfilled, we think of what's called a one-to-one prophecy to fulfillment. And in your, in your notes there, there's a little box there, and that's called psat. That's one-to-one prophecy fulfillment. I'll give you an example of that, which we just had uh, last week. An angel comes down and gives a prophecy to Zechariah. We'll just break it into two things. He prophesies to Zechariah. He says, your wife Elizabeth will have a baby in her old age, and you will name him John. That's a prophecy. That's a things to come, right? He's saying these are, these are two things that are going to happen. And then shortly thereafter, Elizabeth becomes pregnant in her old age, and then Zechariah names the baby John. Prophecy fulfilled, right? Angel says this is what's going to happen. That's what happens. And that's prophecy fulfilled. That's a one-to-one fulfillment. Now, the Jewish writers, that's one of the ways they use the Old Testament prophecies. But they use the prophecies in actually four, or they use the Old Testament prophecies and even pictures in four different ways. And we're going to see these things keep coming up in our study. Now, this is just one of four ways the, the New Testament authors use the Old Testament And so here we have Matthew quoting from Isaiah chapter 7. And it's important for us to turn to Isaiah chapter 7. So go ahead and get in your scriptures and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 7. And we're going to look at exactly what Matthew is doing. And this this may be a new concept to a lot. I remember when I learned this uh, idea in seminary that there were different ways New Testament authors used Old Testament prophecy. It was a challenge for me to understand, and there were some hard things that came with it, but as we understand it, it actually is a powerful way in which God used Old Testament prophecy and New Testament fulfillment, but Isaiah chapter 7 is where we find this very common and well-known prophecy about this virgin who will give birth to a son. Let me just give you a little bit of the background as to what's happening here in Isaiah. Because that's important, right? Context is important for what's happening in Isaiah. And then we'll see how Matthew uses it. But here's the context in Isaiah. The king of Judah, uh, a man named Ramez, or Ahaz, sorry. The king of Judah. So you have the two kingdoms of Israel. The southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Called Israel um, or Ephraim. They're divided. And the king of Judah, Ahaz, learns that the northern kingdom has joined, uh, the northern king, a guy named Pekah, 
has joined with Syria, a pagan nation, a non-Jewish nation, and that king, Rezin, they've joined together to come and destroy Judah, to destroy the Davidic kingdom. This is what they've decided to do. This is what these two kingdoms have. They've decided to join together. They've joined their forces. They've joined their armies. And they are going to come and destroy Ahaz. And they are going to put a stop to this Davidic line, to the Davidic kingdom. And they're going to crush the, the, the country of Judah. This is a serious army. And Ahaz hears about this and is terrified. He's terrified. He doesn't have the army to fight these people. And so there's, there's all kinds of things at risk. The, the kingdom of Judah, the line of David, it's... Their desire is to crush it all. God comes to Ahaz through the prophet Isaiah and speaks to him and says, this is not going to happen. This this union of Ephraim and Syria to come and attack Judah and overthrow and destroy the Davidic kingdom is not going to happen. And then God does a a thing, uh, an interesting thing. He asks Ahaz, he says, ask me for a sign. Ask me for a sign that it's not going to happen. And Ahaz says, I'm not going to ask you for a sign. Who am I to question God? And God says, okay, here's the sign that you will know that I will, I will fulfill my promise. That this attack will not destroy you. And then we come to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This is the sign that God says, I'm going to give you a sign so that you know this attack will fail. This is Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's our quote in Matthew. Continue. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Okay, so there's a couple notes here I want to just highlight. So this, the Hebrew term here, when Isaiah writes, behold, here's the sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and you shall name him Emmanuel. The term there that's translated virgin also an equally good translation, and this is a footnote in your, in your handout. You can read it later, but it could be translated young woman. So remember, and I want you to, as much as you can, put Matthew aside for a second and just think of yourself in Isaiah's time. You've heard news. Ahaz has heard. These kingdoms are going to come down and destroy him. God says, I'll give you a sign that that, that attack will fail, and actually I'm going to bring the kingdom of Assyria, and I'm going to crush both of them with this other pagan kingdom, and I'm going to give you a sign And it's going to be this boy born of a young woman, and you will call him Emmanuel. And when he is born, before he is of this certain age, you will know that this attack has failed. Now, if you look with me to chapter 8 of Isaiah, you'll see when the sign comes, the sign that, that God promised through the prophet Isaiah. This is eight chapter, th- or chapter 8, verse 3. And I went to the prophetess, this would have been Isaiah's wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Mahershalah Hashbaz. Don't name your kids that. For before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. And so they have this little baby boy that is the fulfillment, right? So God said, Hey, this woman, this young woman, which is a totally appropriate translation of that term, this young woman's going to have a baby, and when you see that baby, you're going to be remembered his name is Emmanuel, that God is with his people, and you'll know that what I've promised you is true. And then that baby comes, and they know, they go, this is the sign that God promised, that, his, that he promised to give us, so we would know that this attack will fail, and sure enough, the Assyrians come in and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. And then actually they continue down and it's it's a mess, but this is the prophecy fulfilled, right? This is what God promised and here's where it happened. 
Now when we look forward into Matthew, it brings some questions for us. And this is how Matthew is, is a different way in which Matthew is going to use the prophecy in Isaiah. What God intended in Isaiah was more than just that local fulfillment. But there's an ultimate expression of that coming, and that's what Matthew's doing. So this is a different way of the New Testament authors using the Old Testament prophecies. And this is called Remez in that chart. You have a little chart there. This is called Remez. So what Matthew shows us is that this prophecy isn't a one-to-one sense in Isaiah. It's bigger than that. And, and the terms used in this remez is a type and an antitype. An antitype is the ultimate expression of something. Let me just illustrate this simply. It's not a great illustration, but it hopefully it helps my mind. So this is what? Okay, this is a balloon, right? Let's see if I do this without passing out. Now, what is this? It's a balloon, right? They're both balloons. But which one is a fuller expression of what the balloon is intended for? The flat one or this one? I think I have another one here somewhere. Just in case it popped or had a hole. Okay? This is a more fuller, or we'll call it the ultimate expression of a balloon. They're both totally balloons. You're both 100% right in calling them both balloons, right? Now here, that's a simple picture, but hopefully it's helpful. We'll see the prophecy in Isaiah, a fulfillment of what God promised to do, but we'll see how Matthew uses it, how God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, directs Matthew to see what's going on in this prophecy in Isaiah. This is a type and an antitype. I want to start with a, a biblical illustration of this that's simpler, and then we'll get to our prophecy in Isaiah. One picture, as, as Paul and, and I and Nate were setting out, a one picture that's clear, clearly remez, this type of use by the New Testament authors, clearly this remez type is the Passover lamb. You guys are familiar with the Passover lamb, right? The Israelites are about to come out of Egypt, and God says, hey, kill a lamb, Put the blood around your doorposts and the angel of death will pass you by the Passover lamb. Paul in Corinthians identifies Jesus as the Passover lamb. Now, is Jesus a lamb? No, right? He's a human being. But he is, whereas the Passover lamb, this innocent animal shedding its blood to cover us and protect us from death, that's a type. And Jesus is the ultimate expression of that Passover lamb. Does that make sense? It's tracking? So here we come to Matthew and how he uses this prophecy from Isaiah. And here we'll see. You can look in your notes or look on the screen. And it's broken down. I I broke down the titles. That's probably too hard. That may be difficult for some of you to see. But in Isaiah, the prophecy refers to a young woman. Because we see Isaiah later goes into his wife, and they have a son in a natural way. So it's this young woman. The ultimate expression of that is who? Vir- the Virgin Mary. Yeah, you can, you can answer. The ultimate expression of that young woman here is the Virgin Mary. And even in, even in Isaiah's choice of the word, because there was a word he could have used that specifically denoted a young woman or a wife and specifically referred to a virgin only. But he used a word that could be translated either way. So even in God's inspirational inspiration to Isaiah, speaking the prophecy, gave us this range of meaning where it could be young woman or the ultimate expression, a virgin. So here we have this young woman and here we have the Virgin Mary. Second, we have Isaiah's son born. This son that's born that's to remind his people of God's promise. The ultimate expression of that is who? Jesus, right? What, what the, the, this gospel of Matthew, what Matthew is revealing to us, the ultimate expression of that is Jesus. In Isaiah, he says, you will, you will name him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Because they would remember, oh, this son, born of this young woman, 
is a, is a sign that God is with us and keeping his promises. In Jesus, the ultimate expression of God with us, because it's actually God with us in human form. So you see how in, the, in Isaiah, it's this type. Remember, God hasn't forgotten his promises. And then in Jesus, the ultimate expression is that God is standing with us on the earth. I mean, the ultimate expression of Emmanuel. And then the sign was that it would preserve the Davidic throne, that it wouldn't be crushed and it wouldn't be destroyed, but God would preserve it and the ultimate as the type. And then the ultimate expression or the antitype is that now God has fulfilled it. Jesus is through the line of David in the Davidic throne through his father Joseph, which we're going to see in a second, and is the fulfillment of the Davidic promise in 2 Samuel 7, that God would establish the house of David forever. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that, whereas in Isaiah, it's just a preservation of that line. But God will keep the line open, and Jesus is the ultimate expression or antitype of that. So, catch your breath. Yeah, there you go. We're going to see, so I put this chart on here that shows the four different ways. You don't have to totally understand that, but as we move through Matthew, we're going to see the different ways the New Testament authors use the prophecy. And as we study scripture and we understand that, it actually, at least in my own heart and mind, brings a greater appreciation and worship to what God is doing throughout the entire history of the world. It's not just a simple, not that prophecy is simple, but it's not simply one-to-one all the time. That God is building and doing things that he's going to reveal later in the New Testament in incredible ways. And how this picture and what happens in Isaiah is totally and ultimately expressed in these antitypes, in this fulfillment, the true fulfillment in its fullness of this prophecy that God gives in Isaiah. Now, as you think about that, there may be some questions. That's right. Paul and I will be up after the baptism today. Please come up and talk with us and ask us any questions you might have. Then we get to this last section. This is Joseph's decision to marry and adopt. Joseph's decision to marry and adopt. Joseph hears what the angel has said. And despite how unbelievable it sounds that this woman who he's betrothed to is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He believes and he obeys. And so he responds here in verse 24. He wakes up from his dream. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife But he knew her not until she had given birth to a son. Just a note from Matthew. They didn't come together sexually, even when he he completed the marriage. But he waited until after they had Jesus, after Mary delivered Jesus, to come with her sexually. Mary would go on to have other children. But he waited until Jesus was born. She was a virgin all the way until Jesus was born. And he called his name Jesus. Why is that important? Well, as we remember, one of the problems that Matthew gives us is how is Jesus going to be the son of David through Joseph with this curse of Jeconiah? Then Matthew somewhat resolves that by saying, well, Jesus isn't Joseph's descendant. Jesus isn't the son of Joseph. He's the son of Mary. But here what we see is when Matthew takes Mary to be his wife and names Jesus, which was illegally which was a legal procedure to give your son a name. He, Jesus received legally sonship and heir and became an heir of Joseph in, in the status of the community. Joseph married Jesus' mother and Joseph named Jesus Jesus. He named the Messiah Jesus, fulfilling and completing what Matthew has shown that now through this just simple line at the end of chapter 1, and he named him and he called his name Jesus, was the fulfillment of this adoption where now Jesus 
is the rightful heir of all that is Joseph's, though he's not an actual blood descendant. And so the curse of Jeconiah is alleviated on Jesus, but Jesus is able to receive and and be an heir of all that is Joseph's. And so we see how God, in uh, something that only God could do, answers and solves all these problems that come up in just the first chapter of Matthew. There are going to be more problems that come up as we continue to study through this, and God is going to reveal how he will answer them with Jesus. Just a couple notes as we close and then head into the baptism. As as Matthew reveals the naming of Jesus, the naming of this baby as Jesus, he reveals two things, one in the naming and the one through the prophecy. It says, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The Messiah was supposed to come and save people from Caesar, from this, from this wicked, oppressive nation, is what the Jews had anticipated and expected. But here, Matthew reveals a different purpose this time when Jesus comes. There will be a day when Jesus comes and sets his people free from oppressive rulers and tyrannical kings and Caesars. But it's not this time. It's not this day. And it's not this coming of the Messiah. He came to save his people from their sins. And then it's interesting that Matthew actually changes a word in the prophecy. He says, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Where in Isaiah it says, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Either referring to Isaiah or the mother. And he takes it and makes it plural. And I think it's because Matthew's looking on, the, and, and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, seeing that those who are saved from their sins by this Messiah, will recognize that God is with them. They, we, the people of God, will cry out that God is with us. The people who have been set free from their sins, who recognize that is what the Messiah came to do this time. He came to set us free from our sins. Another thing, and this is just a kind of a principle for us, even as we look at this, we see there's some technical stuff in here. There's some difficult, challenging things to wrestle through as we study God's Word. It's just an encouragement from us to you, and we're so encouraged by by many of you, the conversations we have, the conversations I get to hear about that are happening in home groups. But push in and study God's Word. Sometimes I think we have an impression of God's Word that it's magical, that we can open it and read it just real quickly and maybe just flop it open in the morning and read and you're reading in numbers and you're reading about Balaam and God's trying to teach you something. Come to, come to God's word and seek to study it and put yourself in a place where you can ask questions. Don't be afraid of questions. That's how we learn. Whether that's home groups or Bible studies or just meeting with any of the pastors, we'd love to engage with you in a study of God's word and the questions that come out of that study. See, we're not first century Jews, none of us. And as I was talking with a friend of mine yesterday who goes to a different church, and I was just sharing with him about the series, he was so encouraged, and as we talked about it, we realized our culture and this first century Jewish culture have almost zero things in common. And so as we study the background, ask questions and dive in and study God's word together, that's what God would ask of us, to engage our hearts and minds that by the power of his Holy Spirit, he could transform us. And so I'd encourage you, if you're not in a home group or in a Bible study, join one. Take the next step. Yeah, don't feel guilty if you're not. Maybe your life's crazy. You don't have time right now. But, but I pray that this would be a seed planted in your heart that, okay, I want to get more involved. I want to be in a place where I can talk about God's word and have my questions answered. Just because Paul, myself, and Nate, and Matt are pastors doesn't mean we have all the answers. We get in and we battle it out, we wrestle it out, we come at things from different places and we have different questions and understand things differently. It's true for all of us. Let's be in a situation and place with people that are love us and are committed to us and committed to God's word and handling it rightly. Let me pray for us and then I'm going to invite up my brother uh, Clement in just a few minutes to share his testimony with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and uh, the impact of your word in our lives. 
And my brothers and sisters in here will testify about that from now until the end of time. And we look forward to celebrating with our brother Clement uh, with the work you've done in his life. And God, we celebrate the work you're doing in all our lives as we submit to you and submit to your word. That we would rightly understand that you want to transform us. That you call us to respond in faith to your truth, just like you did Joseph. You reveal the truth to us in our lives and you call us to respond to it. Not out of emotion, not out of some sense of just reaction, but to see the truth and respond to it. Holy Spirit, thank you for revealing the truth to us, that we could see it and respond to it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.